Okay, class. Good day. So let us uh, begin our discussion on the pioneers of scientific management, human relations movement. So these are the pioneers of uh, scientific management who focus their attention this time on people in the organization. For the pioneers of uh, management under time in motion, they focus on the process and the system and the tasks in an organization. But this time, these uh, individuals focus on the people in the organization and the importance of uh, uh, their behavior, their discipline, and their relationship with uh, uh, their co-workers, with uh, the management in the organization. So the pioneers are Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. This is a husband and wife uh, tandem. Elton Mayo, Ibrahim Maslow, Frederick Kersberg, and Douglas McGregor. So Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, the Gilbreths used film to analyze work activity. They would break down the task into discrete elements and movements and record the time it took to complete the elements. So in other words, they were actually fans of the time and motion study of Taylor. So what they did was they used uh, movie cameras to record a uh, uh, individual doing something and they would analyze the movement of the individual and uh, find out whether they can reduce the movement. So of course, if you reduce the movements in a task, that would mean they can work uh, much uh, faster, uh, they save time and they become more productive. The Gilbreds were also focused on worker welfare and motivation. They believe that by reducing the amount of motion associated with the task, they could increase workers' well-being. So in other words, uh, they believe that by reducing the work, reducing the amount of motions associated with the task, they could increase the workers' welfare or their well-being. So in other words, if the individuals have a process of uh, doing their jobs much faster, much uh, easier for them, they will be more happy. They will be more content with their job, be satisfied with their job, okay? So this is also the reason why we train individuals. You know? We aid them with the uh, technology. These are things that will make the job easier for them. They will become better at what they are doing. So they feel motivated because of this, okay? Additional training and new tools and new technology. So if you do this, you help the individual, you also uplift their spirits. Elton Mayo is the father of the human relations uh, movement. So he's the founder of the human relations theory. So he's an Australian. He's best known for the Hawthorne studies or the Hawthorne experiments. So uh, the Hawthorne studies became the base for his lifelong breaking theories on human relations and scientific management. So the uh, Hawthorne experiment was his uh, famous experiment. It was uh, conducted in a factory. So together with his uh, assistant, Fritz, you know, what they would do is uh, they would go to, uh, to, they went to the factory. What they did was they went to the factory and observed uh, the performance of individuals whenever they changed the, some things in the environment. So they experimented with light, they expen experimented with working hours and the duration of uh, break times. So they observed the individuals when they increased uh, the light, for example, in the factory, they made the illumination better. And they observed their performance also when they reduced the light or they made the light a little dim. So they would also see the effect of uh, longer break hours or shorter break hours on the performance of the individuals, on the performance of the workers. So what was surprising here is the fact that uh, even though they changed these factors, the light, the lighting condition, the uh, break time, the number of work hours, it seems as if the workers' performance were not affected. In fact, the performance of the, of the workers were improving. So in other words, 
the output was increasing. So the conclusion drawn was that giving attention to employees resulted to improve performances. I will tell you the reason why later. Later, okay. <laughs> so these were the final conclusions of the experiment. Number one, it's important that individual employees must be seen as members of a group. So in other words, individuals and uh, being a part of a group is very important to them. So in an organization, it's important to understand that individuals or the workers want to have a sense of belongingness. They want to be accepted. Being part of a team, being part of a group is very important to them. If they are happy in that group, that will... Uh, help them be, perform better. Salary and good working conditions may be less important to employees than a sense of belongingness to a group, okay? So people actually normally think that uh, the working environment and of course the compensation is what makes people work better, but according to the Hawthorne experiment, it is not. In fact, uh, the, it suggests that the most important uh, a factor that affects employment is performance is employee happiness. Employees being a, a member of a group and having teamwork. Okay. Number three, informal groups in the workplace have a strong influence on behavior and employees in a group. So, what are informal groups? These are friends. These are the barcada inside the an organization. So in the workplace, there are uh, employees who form parkadas or form a group of friends. Bonds are created. Friendships are made. So this is very important. Managers must take social needs such as belonging to an informal group seriously. So it's important for managers, supervisors to give importance to friendship in an organization, to relationships in an organization to make people happy because this really affects their performance. Okay, so they should take social needs of individuals seriously. So the Houghton experiment actually had this conclusion because uh, in the experiment, they were trying to change physical factors or environmental factors. And uh, they were hoping that, uh, you know, if uh, some of these factors were reduced or improved, it would uh, somehow give them an idea on how to make employees perform better. But surprisingly, these factors did not affect them. So it actually seemed that uh, the physical factors are not important. The environment is not important. What is more important is actually having teamwork, being happy in what we are doing, and the relationship inside the organization. Okay, so the Hawthorne experiments was a breakthrough because it made the uh, you know, uh, managers realize that it's important to take into consideration how people behave in the workplace. So systems, time in motion, processes, tasks, they are all very important. But the most important thing is, of course, the most important resource in the organization, and that is manpower, that's human beings, okay? So relationships and... Uh, how are they accepted, their social needs, their psychological needs. These are very important, okay? The Hawthorne experiment also brought about another phenomenon known as the Hawthorne effect. So it is also called the observer effect. So critics of the experiment actually said that uh, the performance of the employees actually improved because they were conscious that they were being observed. Uh, according to them, if people are conscious or aware that they are being observed, tendency is that they will perform better. Okay, so in a way, it's true. No, if uh, your supervisor or your manager is around <laughs> and uh, trying to look at what you are doing, you know, the tendency is for you to do to do better. No, yung para bang magsisipag ka, kasi nga naanjan sila. So that is honestly Hawthorne effect. Okay, so it's different from the Hawthorne experiment. Take note. Okay, the the Hawthorne effect uh, describes the reaction of uh, individuals who are being observed. Okay, so it's their tendency to to uh, work better because they know that uh, they are being evaluated. 
they are being observed. Next, we have Abraham Maslow. He is an American psychologist. He is well known for creating the hierarchy of needs or the hierarchy of needs pyramid. So Abraham Maslow's theory argues that humans have a series of needs, some of which must be met before they can turn their attention towards others. Certain universal needs are the most pressing, while more acquired emotions are of secondary importance. So you will understand this as I explain his pyramid of needs. So this is his pyramid of needs. No? So you will see that he arranged needs in a pyramid and the levels, there are five levels and the levels are actually ladderized. So you take it one step at a time. So in other words, everything, the, the base no, of uh, the pyramid starts with physiological needs and you cannot go to safety needs if you do not satisfy physiological needs first. This is what he meant. In order to go to love and belongingness, you have to satisfy safety needs. No? And then in order to go to the next level, no, you have to satisfy this need. Okay, so, so you take it one step at a time. That's why it's uh, ladderized. It's a series. Okay. In other words, the needs have a prerequisite. Okay, so you cannot go and satisfy your esteem needs, for example, if you do not satisfy your uh, love and belongingness needs and in, you cannot uh, satisfy love and belongingness if you are not satisfied with your safety needs and you cannot be satisfied with safety needs if you are not satisfied with your physiological needs. That's the very important characteristic of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Lower needs are the priority. So in this case, the most pressing, the most important need is physiological needs, which are also called existential needs. So it's air, water, food, shelter, clothing, and re reproduction or procreation. No? The uh, need to have a family, to have children. Okay. So in other words, uh, a person has to satisfy his biological needs first before turning his attention to other needs. Once he's satisfied with his physiological needs, then he can proceed to safety needs, which is uh, security needs. So people want to be secure. We are very insecure animals. Now, this is uh, the reason why we work for a uh, roof over our head. We buy uh, insurance policies. We have alarms in our cars. We put uh, fences around our houses. We have uh, medical and educational plans because we are so insecure about what can happen to us. So we want to feel safe in life. Next, after that, uh, we work for love and belongingness. Belongingness is uh, social needs. Okay, So we want to be accepted. We want to be part of... Uh, uh, a family, we want to be part of a community, we want to be part of a circle of friends. Okay, so that's love and belongingness. So we, we are social beings. Esteem needs, we are looking at ourselves, our pride, we want to be respected, we have ego. Okay, we do not want to be insulted in public, we, want, we do not want people talking about us behind our backs. We take pride in what we are doing, so this is what we call esteem. Okay, so we work for this also. And after that, it's self-actualization. So this is the peak of the pyramid. So according to Maslow, what a man can be, he must be. This need we call self-actualization. This is a point where we realize that we are content we are with our lives. Now we want to strive to be really happy and we want to do what we really want to do in life. A musician must make music, an artist must paint. A poet must write if he is to be ultimately at peace with himself. So we are not competing with anyone else. Probably we're just competing with uh, with ourselves this time. And uh, we want to be truly happy. That's self-actualization. So this is uh, the peak of the pyramid. Okay. So according to Maslow, we are motivated. We work. The reason why we work is because we are motivated by these needs. We want to satisfy these needs. And this needs is a series, and they are ladderized. No? 
each one has a priority. So we take it one step at a time. So this is a very important theory class and you will be taking this up in college and even in your graduate studies. So this is how popular the, the theory of Maslow is. Okay, and uh, among behaviorists, he is the most famous. Okay. Next, we have Frederick Hirschberg. Frederick Hirschberg's contribution is the two-factor theory or the motivator hygiene theory. Okay, so according to Hirschberg, there are factors in the organization that can satisfy workers, and there are also sat, uh, there are also factors that can dissatisfy workers in their job. Okay, so let's uh, take this illustration. So the factors that satisfy work and improve performance are called motivating factors. These are factors such as uh, increasing salary, bonuses, promotion, giving rewards, giving recognition. So if uh, the organization applies this to, this to their employees, they will notice that employees work better, they become more productive, they become more enthusiastic, more interested in their work workers or employees. Now, there are also factors that may dissatisfy workers once it is decreased or removed. These are called hygiene factors. If you remove or decrease these factors, people will not like to work anymore. So, examples of these are having a clean workplace, you know, a, humane, a humane treatment in the workplace, uh, having fair wage, a very good relationship in the organization, competent leaders, leaders who are really very good. So if you reduce this, you, know, you take away having a clean environment, having respectful relationship with your boss, the leaders are incompetent, this will decrease employee satisfaction. So they do not want to work anymore. So they will be dissatisfied. So it's important for managers to take note of what are motivating factors and what are hygiene factors. So the hygiene factors, you have to maintain that. Kaya na hygiene eh. Kasi pag hygiene, di ba? Like physical hygiene is very important to be maintained, di ba? For you to be healthy. So just the same in a business, in an organization, work hygiene or these work hygiene factors has to be maintain in order to have a healthy, prosperous organization, a wealthy organization. And finally, we have Douglas MacGregor. So in the 1960s, uh, psychologist Douglas MacGregor developed uh, the theories of uh, management called Theory X and Y. They are also called the managerial assumption. So Theory X and Y of Douglas MacGregor is also known as the managerial assumptions, okay? So when we say assumptions, it's like you are assuming. So the manager may assume two kinds of workers according to the theory. If the workers are assumed to be lazy, they are not disciplined, no? uh, they do not uh, somehow... Uh, uh, they do not have initiative, okay? So, tendency is for the manager to be more authoritarian. So, he will become very strict in his management style. That is what you call theory X. Theory X is like, you know, it's negative motivation because in order to make people work, you punish them, you discipline them, you threaten them. Okay? So they will work, no? Because you are assuming, no? They do not have initiative. They do not have self-discipline. Okay? O magtrabaho kayo or else you will be reprimanded, you will be suspended, you will be terminated if you don't work properly. That's theory X. Okay? On the other hand, there is a theory Y. So theory Y is a theory wherein the manager assumes that his employees have self-discipline. Okay, they have initiative. You no, know? they respect the policies. They respect one another. They do not have to be so supervised all the time. 
No, they do not have to be directed all the time. They already know what they're doing. They do not uh, need supervision. Okay. So that's theory why. So the tendency of the manager is to be more lenient this time. No. In other words, they, he doesn't have to be very strict. Okay. He can be very lax in his management style. Okay. Because he's confident that uh, his employees can work alone. Okay. So that's theory why. So it's a, it's a, somehow it's a, it's positive. It's positive motivation also. You know, because, uh, you know, the manager just have to tell them uh, they do not have, he doesn't have to use any uh, coercion. He doesn't need to force people you know, to do something. All he has to do is uh, request them to do something probably. Okay. So that's theory Y. Now, if uh, you're asking which is better, theory X or theory Y, of course, that will be the, that will depend on the type of organization. That will depend on the type of people. An example would be the people in a factory and uh, in an office setting would be different. No? There are factories, well, not all factories. There are factories where in the employees are not that well educated. Are not that well experienced, so theory X may apply. Okay, in an office setting, like in a bank, for example, or in a law firm, okay, in multinational companies, most likely theory Y is more prevalent. Okay, because the people or the employees in such companies are well trained, they are uh, highly educated, no? they have very good experience and very very good social skills. Okay, that's theory. Why? Okay, so this is how I will end my uh, discussion on uh, uh, the human relations movement, the human relations movement and the pioneers of the human relations movement, also known as the behaviorists. Okay, class. So you take care and uh, have a nice day and take care. Stay safe.